Tonight, in the Navy, lewd videos made by a high-ranking naval officer send shockwaves through the Pentagon. I'm Katie Couric. Also tonight, it could be a new weapon in the battle against cancer. A test so sensitive, it can detect a single cancer cell in the blood. They've just taken some of the toughest jobs in the country. America's newest governors inherit budgets in crisis. And can Steve Hartman make his son a star? It's up to you and YouTube. From CBS News World Headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Katie Curry. Good evening, everyone. The USS Enterprise is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier set to deploy to the Middle East later this month. But it's not clear if the ship's current commander will be at the helm when it sets sail. Tonight, he's under fire over a series of raunchy tapes he made several years ago that have now just become public. They were meant to entertain the Enterprise crew, but as Bob War reports, the Navy brass is not amused. Happy in Exodus neighborhood. Even as he was making the tapes four it. years ago, we'll Captain Owen Honors knew he was pushing the limits. There's a really good chance you're going to be offended tonight. At the time, Honors was the so-called XO, the executive officer on the USS Enterprise. In this scene, he plays all three parts. It makes it clear the production is his alone. As usual, the Admiral and the Captain have no idea about the contents of the video. His racy videos, used to introduce movies, were played for some 5,000 sailors on the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Finally, let's get to my favorite topic, and something foreign to the gay kid over there. The tapes are filled with anti-gay slurs, and feature scenes of simulated sex acts. This is certainly the most popular video of any of the EXO movie videos. In one starring role, Honors takes viewers on a tour of shower stalls, men's and women's. This evening, we've got some different chicks in the shower in a clip that was previously too sensitive to show. The tapes were produced in 2006 and 2007, while the Enterprise was overseas supporting the war efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the videos just surfaced this past weekend when the Virginian Pilot newspaper posted clips on its website. Now the Navy has launched an investigation, saying in a statement the tapes were not acceptable then and are not acceptable in today's Navy. The Navy does not endorse or condone these kinds of actions. But Captain Honors, who now commands the Enterprise, is drawing support on Facebook from more than 1,400 people. One woman who served on the carrier, writes his XO movie night, brought comic relief to miserable deployments. Another sailor adds Captain Honors is the heart and soul and morale of the ship. Lieutenant Commander Cheeto Pepler also served with Captain Honors. Captain Honors was an outstanding officer. He was, in my opinion, very visionary. I would definitely sail with Captain Honors again. Honors, who graduated from the Naval Academy and was a Top Gun pilot, has offered no statement or explanation. In his last tape, made in 2007, he acknowledged his humor had triggered some internal complaints but he brushed them all. Well, Enterprise, it's been fun. Please tonight, enjoy the movie and the videos. Now, the Enterprise is set to sail once again for the Middle East in a few weeks, but the Navy right now is taking a hard look at the actions of Captain Honors and also those senior officers who were his superiors when those tapes were made, Katie. And Bob, stand by because some of our viewers posted comments about this story on our Facebook page. Becca Leichner Ryan. A Navy veteran says Captain Honors needs to lose command of his vessel and be forced into early retirement. I'm ashamed and appalled at his lack of sound judgment. But Patrick Covington says, I want this guy out there in command. Nothing in this video is over the line. Anyone who has served in the Navy knows this is, a very, this is very subdued when compared to Navy tradition. So, Bob, does Captain Honors have any chance of preserving his career in the Navy at this point? Well, Katie, my sense is he's in very big trouble. Since the Navy right now is in the middle of an investigation, as I mentioned, the Pentagon will not publicly comment on his status. But officials tell us privately it's very likely he will not be on board as the commander of the Enterprise when that ship leaves port later this month. Katie. All right. Bob Orr reporting from Washington. Bob, thanks so much. Turning to health news now, imagine a blood test so precise it can spot a single cancer cell among a billion healthy ones. Harvard researchers have developed such a test, and today Johnson & Johnson is joining them to someday help make it available to patients everywhere. Medical correspondent Dr. John LaPook explains how this test works and why it's potentially so important. Yeah. 
The current tools for tracking cancer are not always sensitive enough to answer the most pressing question. Is the cancer gone? We're kind of shooting in the dark. We're treating patients based on what seems to work and our best guess. Researchers believe this new test, using just a teaspoon of blood, may be able to detect cancer before it shows up on scans. It will give us a non-invasive or a non-painful way of monitoring a cancer, following a cancer day to day, week to week, without having to do repeat biopsies. Cancers can shed cells that circulate in the bloodstream at extremely low levels. This technology finds them by passing a blood sample through a microchip coated with antibodies that bind only to the cancer cells. The test can recognize a single cancer cell among a billion normal ones. It would be most help for patients with prostate, bladder, colon, nice kidney, and lung cancers, in addition to breast cancers, in many ways this serves as a liquid biopsy. In addition to finding recurrences sooner, the test may allow doctors to examine the cancer cell itself and tailor therapies to a particular patient. Five sites across the country are beginning to use the new test on patients. The research is supported by a $15 million grant from Stand Up to Cancer. If we only had a way of measuring cancers as they're being treated, seeing how they respond relatively quickly and adjusting our treatment depending on how the cancer responds, then it would be a different day for treating cancer. If all goes well, the test is expected to become widely available in three to five years. Katie? And John, this sounds very promising for determining if cancer is spread, but is, is it going to be able to diagnose certain cancers in the future, perhaps replacing mammograms and other screening tests? That is the hope, but we are still so far away from that. Right now, the idea is in addition to searching for the spread of cancer, to actually capture the cancer cell. You've got it in your hand, you can interrogate it, you can examine it, you can say, what are the weak spots? And then change your therapy accordingly. I was gonna say, and maybe it'll lead to new treatments as Absolutely. well. All right, Dr. John LeFouc, John, thanks so much. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to our partner in health news, webmd.com, and search cancer blood test. To Washington now, where the new 112th Congress convenes on Wednesday with the Republicans in charge of the House. Congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes is on Capitol Hill tonight. Nancy, I understand the first order of business for the Republicans will be trying to repeal health care reform, but that's not likely to succeed. It isn't, Katie, but Republicans campaigned first and foremost against the president's health care plan, and so they're making one of their first orders of business, voting to repeal it. They just announced today that they're scheduling a vote for Wednesday of next week, January 12th, right out of the gate. And here's what else they've told us they want to focus on right from the start. They want to vote to cut congressional budgets by 5 percent, and they want to hold hearings on the impact of regulation on job creation, which is another way of saying they want to look into why President Obama Obama's policies didn't create more jobs. Now, this vote to repeal health care is going to be largely symbolic because the Senate, which is still controlled by Democrats, is not going to take it up. And in fact, Democrats are already hitting Republicans for appearing to want to roll back some of the more popular elements of the drug plan, like expanding drug coverage to seniors, which just went into effect, Katie, this Saturday. All right. Nancy Cordes reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. Nancy, thanks so much. Meanwhile, America's newest governors are facing some of the same problems as the Congress, chief among them, tight budgets. John Blackstone now with that story. Raising their right hands may be the easy part of the job for the newly elected governors taking office this week. In California, Jerry Brown took over a state facing a $28 billion budget deficit and unemployment over 12 percent. No more smoke and mirrors on the budget, no empty promises. Brown's No Frills inaugural ceremony featured a high school choir and hot dogs. In Nevada, the new governor is Republican Brian Sandoval. At 14.3 percent, his state has the highest unemployment in the nation. We live in a time when the odds seem to be against us. In New York, Andrew Cuomo became governor of a state with a $10 billion deficit. He came in asking for a pay freeze for all state employees. My gray hairs are multiplying just thinking about what we have to do. Here in California and across the country, what governors are likely to have to do is cut spending. It's one reason that in the 37 states that elected governors, 23 went to Republicans and only 14 to Democrats. But on Inauguration Day, at least, no matter their party, the governors sound much the same. If you had to sum up uh, the message that uh, just about every governor is telling constituents, it's this, this is going to hurt. 
If there's any good news for the new governors, it's this. State tax revenues have climbed from $1.27 trillion in the first quarter of 2009 to $1.33 trillion in the last quarter of 2010, an increase of $61 billion. And the governors proclaim enthusiasm for the challenge. I take my oath proudly optimistic. California, here I come, right back where I started from. Indeed, Jerry Brown was first elected California governor in 1975. His predecessor was a movie star, Ronald Reagan. This time, Brown follows another movie star, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who posted his own Twitter video as he left the tough job of governor behind. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Francisco. The political winds in California may be shifting, but the weather there today is more of the same. A wintry mess of rain and snow sweeping off the Pacific. And Ben Tracy reports this time it shut down part of a key interstate. Getting in or out of Southern California takes a carload of patience. You can get mad, but it's not going to make anything change. Snow and ice covered roads combined with up to 90 mile per hour wind gusts shut down interstates. Backups between Los Angeles and Las Vegas stretch for up to 30 miles. I-5 connecting LA and San Francisco was full, then forsaken, closed in both directions. Big trucks go off the road, a lot of car accidents. Some drivers have been stuck for 20 hours. Others took extreme detours, heading west towards the coast, then north on Highway 101, and then doubling back east, a 250-mile bypass. But this winter wallop is also a novelty. It's like so awesome, it's my first time. Snow now covers rooftops where it's normally 65 degrees, and many Californians just aren't dressed for the occasion. I look outside. And it's snow everywhere. I don't even own a pair of gloves. This is the first time I've ever even seen snow other than in the movies. California has been pounded by rain and snow for two weeks. Mudslides caused an estimated $59 million in damage. And 10 inches of rain fell in Los Angeles in December, the wettest since 1889. Now here's the good news. Late this afternoon, those interstates are starting to reopen and the skies are starting to clear here in Los Angeles. We are looking at a forecast calling for nine days of sunny weather. And Katie, that'll be a very welcome sight here in California. I was going to say Katie. good good news indeed, Ben. Thanks so much. Bad weather is one theory behind a mysterious sight in Arkansas. Dead blackbirds, as many as 5,000 of them scattered everywhere in the town of Beebe. Scientists say it may have been lightning, hail, or even New Year's fireworks that drove them from the sky. About 100 miles away, about 80,000 drumfish turned up dead, likely because of disease. The two incidents are not related. And still ahead here on the CBS Evening News, where today's stage parents are going to turn their kids into stars. Steve Hartman's A Simon America. But up next, his stage career nearly ended in a split second. The saga of Broadway's Spider-Man continues. Well, it wasn't the break he was hoping for. A Broadway performer is just happy he survived a terrifying fall during a preview of Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark. It was the latest mishap for the musical. After eight days in the hospital and nearly a week in rehab, actor Chris Tierney spoke exclusively with Dana Tyler of our New York flagship station, WCBS. It was a horrific moment for a death-defying performer. Spider-Man actor Christopher Tierney tumbled 30 feet before a stunned audience on December 20th. His safety harness was not correctly attached. He's recovering now from extensive injuries, including a skull fracture, broken ribs, and three cracked vertebrae, and described to us what went through his mind as he plunged to the floor. I was falling, and then I saw once I hit the, once I hit the darkness of the, the stage, I had to just turn it real quick so I wasn't going to fall on my head. The last thing I remember was just going... Oh, God. Tyranny is one of four performers injured on the set of the $65 million musical, which features 38 aerial stunts at speeds of more than 40 miles an hour. Last week, lead actress Natalie Mendoza quit the show. She'd suffered a concussion during a preview performance in November. Some Broadway actors say the show is too dangerous and want to see the curtains close on this production. 
Yesterday, the president of the Actors Union released a statement saying that Chris is not the first actor, nor the second, but rather the fourth to be injured on Spider-Man. It's frustrating and maddening and, to some, infuriating. But he goes on to say, live theater, exciting theater, involves risk. Our staff is committed to doing whatever it possibly can to protect our members and to minimize the danger and the risk. For now, the show will go on. Tyranny says he's eager to return to work. But as controversy mounts, the most expensive show in Broadway history will have to wait until February 7th for an opening night. Dana Tyler for CBS News, New York. In other news, the curtain has come down on Brett Favre's career. The Minnesota Vikings quarterback is retiring for keeps this time. What's not going away is a sex scandal stemming from his time with the New York Jets. And it just got bigger. Today, two female massage therapists who worked for the Jets sued Favre for sexual harassment, claiming he sent them suggestive text messages. We'll be right back. We've lost two of Hollywood's most familiar faces. Anne Francis, with that famous beauty mark, became a movie star in the 1950s, making a name for herself in the sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet. But she's best remembered for a pioneering television role playing Detective Honey West in the 1960s. It made her, she said, a role model for young women. Anne Francis died yesterday of pancreatic cancer. She was 80. Cancer also took the life of Pete Postlethwaite with jutting cheekbones and piercing eyes. He didn't have movie star looks, but Steven Spielberg, who directed him in The Lost World, Jurassic Park, called him probably the best actor in the world. Postlethwaite earned an Oscar nomination for In the Name of the Father. Did you do it? Did you do it, son? No, I did not. Pete Postlethwaite, who kept working even as he battled cancer, was 64. And coming up next, George Hartman with tonight's Assignment America. Finally tonight, America is the country where any child can grow up to be president. But the odds are a whole lot better that a kid can become a star thanks to the Internet and pushy parents like Steve Hartman, who got his son a featured role in tonight's Assignment America. For some reason, while most toddlers were focused on Santa this holiday season, my two-year-old son, George, was obsessed with Good King Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas was down on the after hearing the song a couple dozen times at most, George had the song memorized and insisted on singing it constantly, all five verses. A few weeks ago, I posted the clip on YouTube and mass emailed the link, hoping it would go viral. And then I thought, wait a second, what does that make me? You're a stage dad now. I am? You're validating your child by getting him famous. And Cooper Lawrence, author of The Cult of Celebrity, says, I'm not alone. She says thousands of parents who would never dream of taking their toddlers to a commercial audition or baby pageant have no problem putting their children on the YouTube stage. You know, you liking the video is not enough. Right. And him entertaining you is not enough. Right. The fact that you need a bunch of strangers. Right. To agree. Do you know a good counselor? I can You're going to need one. Yeah. First, though, this is it. I wanted a second opinion. I flew to Orlando to meet David DeVore, Hi. knowing if anyone yeah. could justify my exploits, yeah, right. it would be him. Yeah. Thanks so much for seeing us. Yeah. This is Come great. A couple years ago, David shot a video of his son. Hi, David. How you doing? David Jr. Let's see your teeth. Right after That's dental teeth. surgery. Okay, now. It's been viewed by millions. Okay, now I, I have two fingers. That's 75 Good. million views. Four You're proud of that, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually 76 well, million that views. That answers so. that question. <laughs> David says he didn't post his video hoping it would go viral, but he understands completely why some parents are now. First, there are the comments. It never gets old seeing, oh, this is the coolest kid. And secondly, Is this real life? There are the t-shirt sales, combined with ads, endorsement deals, and international public appearances. Ooh, I saw David, Dad. And you've got a roughly $100,000 a year enterprise. And little David. Unfortunately, in my case, it's a moot point. Whereas David's video is now up to 77 million views, mine is holding steady at 
527. Apparently, a two-year-old singing Christmas carols in Old English is only spellbinding for about 12 seconds. And after three minutes of it, people tend to tune out, gather bedding, okay, enough pillows, and enjoy a bologna sandwich. The lesson? If you're looking for validation, your kid is cute and wonderful, you're not likely to find it by posting Christmas carols, which is why we're moving on to Andy Williams. Moon River has just 87 views, but one of those is Andy Williams, and he's invited George to sing a duet at his theater in Branson, Missouri. Are you going to let him do that, Steve? Well, that'd be being a stage dad. <laughs> Meanwhile, all five <laughs> verses of Good King Wenceslas, that's impressive. Thank I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check it out. I think so, too. All right. Thanks, Steve. And that is the CBS Evening News for tonight. I'm Katie Couric. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night. Thank you.